Genesis chapter 12. And we'll pick up on where we left off the last time, Genesis 11. And uh, I'll read it first. I'll only read from verse 1 to 9. Genesis 12, verse 1 to 9. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had, they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan, so they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And when he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed, going on still, toward the south. This is God's word. As we were mentioning the last few weeks, uh, if you took the time to read Genesis 10 and Genesis 11, you will notice that there is a significant lack of the mention of people calling on the name of the Lord, right? And so we had that series on the perils of prayerlessness. Uh, from the beginning of Genesis, you will find man and God interacting with each other. But you have no record of that in Genesis 10 and 11. Here in Genesis 12, you find that interaction revived again. So if I may title this series that we're going to have in the next few weeks as the revival of prayer. The revival of prayer. Uh, you, you will find that in verse 8, right? Finally, again, we see this once again. We, we read of Abram, his name was still Abram, building an altar to the Lord and calling on the name of the Lord. That's so refreshing to see. Again, after generation, 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 and generation, and generation, the last one that we ever hear of somebody walking with the Lord was Noah. The last one that we ever hear of somebody building an altar and then calling on, on the name of the Lord, at least recorded in, in the book of Genesis, is Noah until we have Abraham coming in. And it begins with God initiating this relationship with Abraham. And calling him out from where he was, right? And asking Abraham to follow him by faith. Uh, as you read that, though, we understand this that in our relationship with the Lord, we can see in the scripture that it is always God who takes the initiative. God is sovereign, we are free moral beings. Right? God did not make us as robots, as Pastor was saying. We, we end up in hell forever because it's the choice that we have made. 
Right? We, we don't understand fully God's sovereignty and salvation and in all things because that's why He's God. But we do know that we have been made by God as free moral beings responsible for the decisions that we make. God is not the author of evil. And yet, while we are free moral beings, He is also the God who is sovereign. And so here, we just see here, though, as we, as we go into this, to this first point of this, the revival of prayer, which will be our point for the day, really, is, first of all, we see that in our love relationship with God, it is always God who takes the initiative. John states that clear, clearly. He says, we love him because he first loves us. And so here we see that Abraham's response of worship and prayer is exactly just that. It was a response. It was a response to God's initiating love. It was a response of God's call for him. And so here's the first thing we notice about Abraham's prayer and worship life. First of all, we see that Abraham's worship and prayer life was a response to God's call for him out of an idolatrous environment to a life of faith and obedience to the living God. People, people often ask me, they, they would say, uh, why are there so many religions in the world? Well, if you really study the scriptures, there was a time when all the people of the world knew one true God and worship one living God. But I would dare say that in the time of Nimrod, that's when people started to elevate themselves and with the scattering of the nations through the confusion of the languages, that spirit rubbed off, that rebellious spirit rubbed off. And here's what we learn, that if we try to worship God in our own understanding, we will end up worshiping, worshiping a God of our own making. And so uh, we don't have much time. I won't go into much detail, but if you take the time to study these passages, you will find that Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And what you will discover there is that Ur of the Chaldees was a very idolatrous environment. And so out of that idolatrous environment, God calls him out of it. First out of his country, we read in verse 1. And then out of his family, that means his relatives. Out of his relatives. Uh, because probably even his relatives were engaged in idol worship. Uh, perhaps some of them still remember the stories of the living God from Noah, but trying to mix it, right? And so here God, he was, by the way, already fulfilling his redemptive plan for man. And we'll talk about that one of these weeks. But he calls Abraham out of this idolatrous environment to a life of faith and obedience in the living God. Because he says to him, uh, I want you to go out from your country from your family, from your father's house. And he says, I will lead you out of there to a land which I will show you. Abraham's response then was to call upon the name of the Lord and worship the Lord. Uh, finally, you know, he was worshiping the true and living God. But it was a life of faith. Because imagine being called out of your own country, being called out of your family, your support system, and out even of his father's house, where he had to separate from his very siblings, and he just took Lot with him, and they would journey to the land that God was showing them. That took a lot of faith. So as we, as we think about that, I'd like us to think of three things when we think about prayer and worship to the Lord. Number one, prayer must be informed by the Word of God. Genuine prayer, true prayer, must be informed by the Word of God. 
Abraham learned to pray as God revealed himself to him. He understood now who was the true and living God, right? He came out from an idolatrous environment. Now he understood who the living God was, who the true God was, as God revealed himself to him. Now, God reveals himself to us through his word today. In practical application then, what this means for us is that we just cannot expect to really grow in prayer if we do not grow in the word also. So when you pray, you take time to be in the word also. Because prayer must be informed by the word of God. In Psalm 19, if you want to study that later on, on your own, Psalm 19 tells us of two kinds of revelation, two kinds of the way that, two kinds of ways that God reveals himself. You probably heard this before, you know, in many discipleship series or many preachers who've come here. But God reveals himself to us by general revelation. Uh, the psalmist wrote about this when he said, uh, the firmaments, right, are the handiwork of God. We know that God is there as we look at creation. That's why, you know, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, you cannot just look at creation around you and not believe that there is God, right? I really believe that there is no person who is a genuine atheist. <laughs> because somehow, deep in the heart of man, he believes that there is this superior being who created all things somehow. And so if, if you have a friend who is a, an atheist and does not believe in God, just point him to the fact that people may worship different kinds of gods, but the fact that their heart is searching for God is actually proof that there must be a God who created people with this kind of desire in their hearts. But general revelation, if that was the only way that God would reveal himself, we would probably make up our own gods. That's why you have people who worship their ancestors. You have people who worship nature. You have people who worship people, strong leaders that they have come to know uh, in their own history. And so God talks about in Psalm 19 what we would call as special revelation. Uh, to make it straight to the point, God gave us the Bible so through the scriptures, we could actually know who he really is. Prayer must be informed by the word of God. By the way, if prayer is not seeking for our wills to be done, but prayer, according to Jesus, we pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven then that necessitates that as we pray, we need to open the word. If prayer is a conversation, our prayer is how we talk to God, but listening to the Lord through the word is how we listen to him. Reading his word is how we listen to him. Prayer must be informed by the word of God. Secondly, the journey of faith requires resources of faith <laughs> right the journey of faith requires resources of faith god called god on a journey of faith he could not make that journey on his own resources abraham realized that and so he builds an altar to the lord worships the lord and calls upon the name of god you see the opposite of that you see how that's contrasted to uh, nimrod Nimrod relied on his own strength. He relied on people until God showed Nimrod that just like that, all their ambitions and their dreams to dust. If there's anything that we have learned from uh, this pandemic, it's that just like that, God can change everything. Right? Just like that. Everything will change. The businesses realize that. By God's grace, churches are going on. 
but with just one snap of his finger with the pandemic, it helps us to see that the journey of faith requires resources of faith. Now, let me just say that God has given us four resources uh, to help us grow in our Christian life. First of all, he gave us the resource of his word. By his word, our faith is strengthened, not only in form, but strengthened. He gave us the resource of prayer by which we may lay hold of the resources of heaven. He gave us the resource of fellowship by which we may be encouraged. Right? You know, uh, Mr. Marion was just saying, and we thank the Lord for Zoom, even, even if it's been hard. But can you imagine now, for more than a year now, if there was no Zoom, how would we meet? Uh, maybe we'd figure out how to do conference calls on the phone, but imagine how difficult that must be. At least in Zoom, we can see each other. We can still, you know, project songs and pray together through it. We are blessed. This may be crumbs, but these are crumbs of grace. And we will be like that woman, Lord, even if it's just the crumbs, that is enough for us. For we know we have the bread of life, who is Jesus. Thank you. For that. And there is the resource of evangelism. Uh, you know, we actually grow as we seek to share the gospel with others. <coughs> and the churches grow as we push through with the mission that God has given us. I said four. There's actually a very important resource that every believer has. And this is the center of it all. And that's Christ in us through his Holy Spirit. Never forget that. And no matter how tough it is, we have the Holy Spirit. Thus, we are told in the scriptures, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Be filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit will use all those other four resources to enrich your life, to strengthen you, to take you where God wants you to be. And finally, prayer is the natural habitat of the genuine believer in the living God. Let me say that again. Prayer is the natural habitat of the genuine believer in the living God. Whether you're on Zoom or whether you're here, can you take a deep breath for me right now? Just a deep breath. Right? Don't, take, don't hold it for too long. <laughs> you might be rushed to emergency. <laughs> but some of you are very good swimmers. You could probably hold your breath for like 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds, sorry, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds, or even a minute, so to speak. That a minute is actually already long. Like, uh, uh, you know, when we would be in the swimming pool with the kids, we used to sometimes go on the, on the wind side. We would go from one side to the next and take a deep breath and things like that. But no matter how good you are in taking a breath, you can't do it for more than an hour. Because you need, you need air. Prayer is the natural habitat of the genuine believer in Christ. If God is the air we breathe, we need to pray. If Christ is the living water, we need to drink. As we pray. If Christ is the living bread, we need to feed as we pray. Because prayer is the natural habitat of the genuine believer in the living life. And so as we as we end this, remember, prayer must be informed by the word of God. God the journey of faith requires resources of faith and prayer is the natural habitat of the genuine believer in the living
there's a not a new song, but a song by uh, Michael Smith. You are the air you breathe. It's true. And that's why we need to pray. Prayer ought to be as natural as breathing in our lives. As you're struggling in your joyful times, while you're driving, just don't close your eyes, as Pastor would say. <laughs> as you're having a rough time with the grocery, going there on that lineup, as you're struggling with your anxieties and stress, you're breathing prayer. He is the air we breathe. He is the living water. He is our bread. Father, thank you for your word. I pray as we go now to prayer, that you will just bless our hearts, Lord, and uh, guide us, Lord, even as we, I know that here in person, we cannot divide into groups, but even as we pray for those things that are, the, those items that are assigned to us, encourage us through what we've learned from the life of Abraham. By the way, thank you, Lord, for initiating this love relationship that we enjoy with you now. Thank you that you're indeed the shepherd who looks for your lost sheep to bring us back to yourself. We love you, Lord, and praise you for your goodness and grace. Strengthen our hearts as we prepare ourselves once again for the coming weeks ahead. We entrust that to God to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.